before we begin. Okay. Okay. So welcome to the meeting. As we just uh, talked about, we're beginning a couple of meetings where we're going to go through this most excellent book. I think I first read the um, first edition of this book when I was a postdoc uh, at the University of Manchester. And the um, thing that I really admired about it is that a lot of spatial um, ecology books and a lot of statistics books are either written by GIS technicians or GIS engineers, uh, or they're written by statisticians who don't bother themselves with um, the day-to-day -day, um, needs of, of regular scientists who aren't also statisticians. And even though I had the stats background, I just, I just really love the way this book was written. And so a couple of years ago, when the second edition came out, um, I wanted to get my hands on it and I just haven't really had the time to read it and uh, I haven't been disappointed. It's just as good as I remembered. Uh, it retains some of the features um, that I remembered that I liked and it even retains some of the idi idiosyncrasies that um, while I admire them, I, I probably wouldn't practice or advise them to be practiced in modern times. So we'll talk about those uh, as, it, as they arise in the first couple of chapters here. Now, um, what we're going to do today is uh, I'm going to give a bit of an overview of chapter two, which just talks about the idea of spatial data, which is different than the normal data. And I'm just going to breeze across the top, just like the chapter does, and then uh, spend enough time, leave enough time to go through some code, which you can follow along with as well, if you wish. Um, chapter two is a bit of an R refresher in this book where the author goes through um, some of the practicalities that are specific to spatial data structures. And uh, I've, ne I've actually never seen a resource that does it with as much care and with just as much simplicity as this does, because oftentimes to use R as a GIS, even though it's very powerful, it's easy, it's very lightweight compared to any alternatives, like um, if you use GIS software, uh, QGIS is a is a popular open source and free one. It's a it's a popular alternative. It's not a straight up replacement for, but it, for most people, it would be a a straight up alternative to ArcGIS. Of course, we have an ArcGIS license here on campus, and it, it's fun to use too, and obviously very powerful. But you can use R to do a lot of this stuff. But there are some peculiarities. And uh, I really like the way that chapter two goes through those, and we'll touch base on some of those in the coding section. So <clears throat> one of the one of the things that makes using R as a GIS really valuable is that there has been a proliferation. Now, I, I don't know how you guys view this, but um, I'm just casting my eyes across the people who are um, who are in the chat right now. And even though some of you may want to argue with me on this, I'm pretty sure that I'm older than all of you. Not put together, but I'm older than all of you. And during my career, the importance of sensor data in doing ecology and doing agriculture and doing lots of things in science has really changed a lot. And when I began my career, using GIS tools was only available to experts. And uh, over time, because the availability of remote sensing data has um, increased so incredibly, uh, so have the tools. And it has made it easier than ever for non-specialists to get their hands on open data, but also the tools are easier to use. And so non-specialists can, can do things. We're, what we're talking about is uh, things like um, remote sensed satellite data, and it, it couldn't necessarily be restricted these days to um, red, green, and blue, and maybe some other spectral bands of pictures of the Earth. But uh, we have um, specialized tools that uh, might might um, allow us to to measure directly 
vegetation cover, soil moisture, um, topography with LIDAR. We can get uh, um, binocular um, depth readings. We can put it together uh, to study spatial aspects of, um, of point patterns and, and other kinds of patterns. This is an example that's in the book of, um, of tree locations, and there are some features, some topogra topographical features that are also superimposed of the, on this map of um, California. And of course, with spatial data like this, we are thinking always about X and Y coordinates, and oftentimes the X and Y coordinates are longitude and latitude. There's some special issues to do with um, with uh, how we treat those X and Y coordinates. And, and actually quite a lot of chapter two um, essentially cracks that open and I hope makes it very accessible. So just to summarize what I said, there's been an increase in sensors, an increase in the availability of data. It's um, it's powerful and we can use it for research that that often but uh, means that it is open but it doesn't always mean it's free, uh, but there is also quite a lot of um, free and powerful and high detail data available. It's been this uh, concomitant uh, development of statistical methods and software, not just R, but uh, methods in today, the most, most popular um, software scripting platform for GIS, without a doubt, is Python, but um, Java and, and R, uh, holds its own amongst, especially amongst scientists. Um, and we have this so-called spatial data, which we're going to dive into to a moderate degree. Um, there are subtleties, but, uh, you know, basically we have what we call geolocations uh, that have X and Y coordinates. And they, they, could, they, they could be explicit with long, longitude and latitude, but they don't have to be. They can be relative as well. Um, one thing that it might be a new concept, I, I, I hope um, some people have, have come across this before, but there are different ways to geolocate locations on the earth um, that, that essentially geographers and, and map technicians, map engineers, GIS specialists have dreamt up over the years. And I mean, I, when I say dreamt up, I use that for a little bit of comic effect because there are literally hundreds of them. There are a few that are very common, but there literally are hundreds of them. And uh, these schema are called uh, coordinates, uh, coordinate reference system, CRSs. And we'll start working with our first CRS today. And in fact, I didn't talk about it, but when I did the biodiversity mapping, um, some of the code in that script that's now up on the website um, were to define the CRS um, and translate the structure of it from the XY coordinates from the biodiversity open data to Google's um, CRS from the, the background that I was using for the map. Okay, so now there are some special problems, but the you know, bad news, the special problems have a lot of subtleties. That's the bad news. It's, it's hard to be an expert in all the subtleties for spatial data. But uh, the good news is that really there are only a couple of categories of these special problems. So I just summarized them here. Um, one of them has to do with uh, statistical properties of the data. And uh, one of them, this is a subtle point, but when we have spatial data, almost always we have loads and loads of data points. And um, there's this concept of statistical power. And uh, power is the the probability that if some some effect that you're going to measure in in nature through the sampling of data is true, let's say relative to a statistical model you're you're testing, and let's say your hypothesis is true in reality, and somehow we know that um, we're omniscient and we know that, and then you collect your data, perform the test, and you also conclude that your hypothesis is correct, you reject the null and it's true that there is an effect. Um, we, we call the probability that you're going to arrive at that, that true conclusion, given that it is true, we call that your statistical power. And power in um, all of 
all of uh, statistics as we know them is a function of sample size. And there's, there's also a thing we've talked about quite a lot in here, um, effect size. So how, how big the quantification of the difference is you're attempting to detect? Well, because spatial data has a lot of data points, your power is almost always large, even when your effect size is very, very small, even if the effect size is um, practically meaningless. So this is a pitfall. Um, it's nice because if you do a lot of statistical tests and that's all you focus on in your um, in your spatial data analysis, you can fall into that pitfall. Uh, but but it's nice because you get positive um, rejection of the the null, so you get a small p value. But it's a pitfall nonetheless uh, for obvious reasons. Second, there is this really um, pernicious problem called spatial autocorrelation. And uh, I wish I could think of the exact quote or who said it indeed, but um, there is a, a phenomenon that um, stuff tends to be similar if it's close together in space and it tends to be more different if it's far apart. And this phenomenon is simply called um, spatial autocorrelation. And it just means that if you measure something, uh, animal population, a crop characteristic, and uh, you sample in multiple places, those places are close together because of things in the environment, the, whether that's biological or environmental, that you haven't measured that, are, uh, that impinge on the system to uh, create the phenomenon you've measured uh, are similar in space. It, it means that the measurements are also correlated in space. Well, this is a problem because it, um, for most of statistics, we assume independence of our points, but spatial autocorrelation is, is literally one of the easiest, clearest definitions of the violation of that assumption. So th these are two special problems in statistics that um, have to do with, with spatial data. Now, there's an there's a ecological um, set of concerns as well. <clears throat> That, um, that Plant talks about in the book. And um, one of the things that he, he talks about is the idea of low ecological resolution in uh, spatial data. So just because you measure something across space for some given area um, doesn't necessarily mean that it reflects an ecological process that you might be interested in, whether that's um, some anthropogenic aspect of crop growth or whether it is um, something in the natural world. However, we often have very, these days especially, we often have very high data resolution. This might mean that um, I, see, uh, I see George in the chat just earlier today. She and I were talking about such a phenomenon of, uh, of high data resolution where we're working on a data set where we're, we're the minimum distance that we're interested in is uh, for one data set we're working on is one meter on the earth. But uh, we work with a colleague who has uh, much, much finer resolution data down to say 10 centimeters. And so there's, uh, and remember space is a squared problem. So uh, where we might be satisfied with a one meter, with one meter by one meter block of information, our colleague would like to give us a hundred by hundred block of information. And so this is a challenge. Do we need this resolution? We certainly do not, but it creates a burden. So it's something we have to grapple with. And another thing is that spatial problems tend to be very complicated. Um, I, I should have put this into the language I prefer, which I find a little humorous, that um, spatial patterns tend to be subtle. And by subtle, I mean they're hard, they're complex. So uh, the next slide will show um, examples of these three uh, aspects of ecological properties of, of spatial data, low ecological resolution, high data resolution, and complexity. So let's have a look at the figure from the book. So these three figures are all of the same um, spot on the Earth. One of them measures um, the so-called EC, the electrical conductivity of uh, soil, 
it says the apparent electrical conductivity. There are lots of ways to measure these things. You can measure them with remote sensing, and you can measure them with sensors on the ground and other ways as well. Um, and here we have uh, we have uh, you know quite a stark pattern with a with a scale of conductivity in the spatial conduct context. Um, yet. Uh, if we look at infrared, we see a very different pattern, and this is very high resolution data. We can see our eastings and northings. Um, now, if I look at those numbers, I can't do the uh, translation to physical distance in my head for eastings and nor uh, uh, northings and eastings, but um, this is basically on the order of magnitude of um, a hectare or so, uh, I believe. And the, each one of these little pixels in this picture is an individual nugget of data, a data point. It's very high resolution of this data. But if we if we kind of compare what we see in this middle graph to what we see in the top graph, we see that we have a lot more detail, say, for this um, area of um, low apparent electrical conductivity. We have loads and loads of data points for that that uh, you know may not be very necessary to uh, indeed to, uh, to estimate it. And then finally, at the bottom, there's a, uh, a measure of grain yield for some crop. I think this is wheat. <clears throat> and we can see little, if you look closely, little squares on uh, each square, the resolution of each square is assumed to be um, the average yield for that area. Uh, so this graph, these three panels measuring three different things, overlap the exact same space, and they represent this idea of, um, of ecological resolution, of high um, uh, ecological resolution, pretty high ecological resolution of the electrical conductivity data, very high spatial data resolution for something like the infrared band, but when we overlay grain yield and say compare it to uh, the, the electrical com conductivity and at the same time the infrared um, reflectance, we, we see a, 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 lot of, a lot of patterns that may or may not be meaningful. As a matter of fact, one of the things that, the, uh, that I'll just mention here that the author emphasizes in this chapter is that um, the human mind is very good at picking out patterns, whether or not the data supports it or not. So we have to be careful about that. Um, another thing I picked up on when I was rereading this nice first chapter was uh, the so-called Cressy's classification <clears throat> of, um, of spatial data. This is from a geographical perspective, <laughs> but uh, there were um, there were three uh, aspects of of data that are that are geospatial. One is the concept of geostatistical data, and then this is x y point data that you're measuring something with a continuous variable, and it would be something like that soil electrical conductivity or or some other measure of soil moisture. And um, oftentimes when you're measuring points, um, one of the goals is that we want to extrapolate across differences that we measure spatially so that we can estimate uh, a gradient of that value between those points. Okay. And there's also aerial data where uh, we might be able to represent um, data in polygons on the Earth. Let's say that you um, had a couple of fields, and uh, this is again, I'm re re thinking of my conversation and some work that I'm doing with George right now, George and Matt, um, on, on predicting yield in different fields. And uh, we, one thing that we might do, if, if we only have a little bit of information about um, the conditions and the crop that's being grown in a, in a single field, is what if we wanted to predict yield? What we'd probably do if we only had an, um, the minimum information for a single field is we would be able to predict the average expected yield for that whole field. 
and uh, we might represent that field by a polygon and and have that at that mean value as an as a null um, a null model for what the expected yield is. And then there is point pattern data. We've recently had a talk from um, Peter Gimboa. I don't see him in the chat here today, but um, his SADI data that he showed us a few weeks ago on uh, pest outbreaks where there is um, point information in presence and absence of, um, of this pest species fits this point pattern data. And the, this kind of data um, is usually um, it's usually associated with something where we were asking a question about the pattern explicitly like um, is the pattern random? Uh, is it what we would call um, over dispersed where it has an even distribution of patterns or um, is it associated non randomly with some feature that we've also measured on the landscape? So there are these three kinds of data. Well, we typically would use them all even for a modest project. Now here's a couple of examples of, um, you know, this would be an example of point data. This is clay content in soils. And for this, um, we've measured in a, in a systematic grid overlaid on some spatial area, the uh, clay content and these, these uh, gradient lines represent <clears throat> the uh, average estimated value of clay content between the points. And there, a method has been used called Krieging here. It's a valuable skill to know about and, and to use. We contrast that, we've got the same exact data set on the bo bottom plot, where um, here we've used uh, uh, the method like I described with the, um, the crop yield, where every point we just assume on the same here, the same systematic grid, but the, the actual spatial uh, area that we use is arbitrary. It depends on how we make our sampling design. Here we assume that each of these grids has the same value spatially as the point that we measured. So these are examples of um, here. It's the exact same data, but construed with uh, these two different concepts of um, of data under Cressy's classification. OK, so um, what are the fundamental components of spatial data? We'll be digging into this for the chapter in a moment. Well, one is that there is a, a spatial component. This is the bare minimum. You have uh, X and Y. Yet again, I have to think of conversations I've been having between the data team here at Harper and some external colleagues where um, we're trying to convince them that the spatial data component is important for uh, for for in field predictions they want to make. OK, maybe we'll succeed one day. Second, there's an attribute component. This is something associated with that spatial point in space that you measure or possibly classify. So you can have either continuous data or categorical data that you measure. O oftentimes, even a modest project would have of both. <clears throat> in other words, you'd you'd measure multiple things, um, multiple attributes at every point on your map is what I mean by that. Um, another um, another thing to consider here is the scale at which you collect the data and the um, sample size that uh, that you use. This, uh, there are different ways to think about this. A way that I think about it um, natively is uh, I think about it as a, an experimental design. What, what do we want to learn? You know, if we want to learn how the world works and we're going to sample some data to do that. And let's say that we want to learn about earthworms. So um, what, what features or what, um, what the aspects of, of soil habitat are associated with earthworm density. So we may want to think about the scale here. W would we want to um, collect samples on a one meter grid, on a 10 meter grid, on a one kilometer grid? 
which do you think? While I open my windows because I'm baking like a like a pizza pie, um, tell me which one you think would be better for earthworms, one ten or a thousand meters. <laughs> don't see any answers in the chat yet. Um, I also don't know the answer. It's just a thought. Um, question, but uh, probably one meter, I would I would think would be the best one for uh, learning how uh, earthworms are aggregated. So it, the. F the phenomenon will dictate your um, your uh, your sampling resolution. And then finally, there's this concept of uh, what we might call vector data versus roster data. And um, vector data is comprised of points and edges between points or junctions um, caused by points. So uh, vector data could be uh, polygons, it could be single points, or it could be some combination of, of those things, just an edge between points. Roster data, on the other hand, is um, is um, uniform specific areas of data that are either measured numerically or, or classified. So those are two fundamental um, data types. Now, um, <clears throat> there's another aspect of this book that I really like, and uh, that is that um, it's a real challenge when you're teaching and, and also learning about statistics in that um, the the audience, you know, you have you have the challenge of uh, of telling the story. You have the challenge of the technical bits that are associated with whatever it is you're teaching or learning. And uh, then you have um, because you have to use an example, you may have elements of uh, of knowledge or um, existing expertise that puts context on the example you're using. So it's the data story, the technical uh, demands, and the the subject specific knowledge associated with the example. Well, um, on one extreme, you, we could really use any kind of data, any kind of example to just to illustrate the tool, right? And you know, people are smart; they can they can get the idea. But in my experience, it's very difficult, and and the instructor doesn't really pay for that. This the student is always the one that pays. So most of us um, try to take care to um, pick pick data sets that tell a story where the story will will already be familiar to the audience and appropriate, and will ease the burden across those those different demands uh, in a teaching and learning framework. The same is true, actually, in just communicating science. One of the things I really like about this book is um, rather than um, trying to give lots of different examples so that some aspect of the audience will pick up on at least a few of them, um, it's it's really the opposite strategy. The, the author has written this book for a particular group of people, it's a broad group of people, including uh, agricultural ecologists and um, maybe conservation ecologists, <clears throat> but he, he focuses on just a few data sets and uh, all of the examples in the book that are substantive refer back to those data sets. And um, one of the things in this chapter that is done is the introduction of four of the data sets. I'm not going to introduce all of them because we're we may well not go through all of this book. We'll if people really like it, we can decide um, after the the spring break whether we want to keep going. But I thought I'd just you know mention one of them, and one that I really like as well is you know we have the cuckoo uh, bird in uh, in Britain that uh, is declining, and those kinds of birds are prominent big interesting birds across the world. And one of the data um, sets is the yellow-billed cuckoo. And it's talking about, um, again, this is uh, related to a problem that Peter has talked to us about, where 
you have point information and you have some information about um, land cover and habitat. And uh, what Peter is interested in, he's talked to us twice now, I believe, about um, making an, a, a statistical association between those land cover features and the presence of his pest. A, a very common application of that statistical framework is in a conservation one. What are the habitat associations of, of uh, uh, species of conservation concern? So one of the data sets is on this species and uh, asks that question. And um, yeah, the data look like this. Uh, you have a, um, a spatial area, a polygon that is uh, laid out and within the polygon are smaller polygons, each classified according to some uh, habitat classification. So uh, there are a few other examples. I, I decided not to go through them uh, all for this talk. And I know we're going to run out of time and we've already taken 40 minutes. So I'm just going to stop this, this uh, video and start a new one before I do the live coding. People can make comments or ask questions if they have them at this time.